Welcome into a brand new edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you as we get set for more K-State football. Getting closer to the Friday kickoff with Oklahoma State. Probably pretty nice for everybody after a bye week to get a game on a Friday. So you have one less day uh, to kind of sit around and wait and have the anticipation build up. Probably gives some of you a good excuse to bail on work early on Friday and say, hey, I'm heading to Stillwater. Uh, I always love that. I mean, you know, b- minor league baseball team in Wichita, w- when I was working a what I would consider a, uh, a more more real job, and just say, hey, uh, oh, yeah, the wind surge are playing at like 1 o'clock this afternoon on a random Wednesday. Uh, screw the sales job. I'm going to sneak on down to the ballpark and just spend the day there. I used to skip class sometimes at K-State to drive to Kansas City and watch the Royals. Probably my favorite Royals day ever. Doubleheader against the Rays. The game had gotten rained out the night before, and I had a had a free ticket voucher uh, from opening day because there was a long delay on opening day, so they gave everybody a free ticket for any game they were choosing. And the second they announced the game with the Rays was canceled, I think I was sitting in the K-Man like, sports studio waiting for the show to start, and they said, up, oh, going to be a doubleheader, and they said it was going to be you know one admission, so you got both games for the price of one. I was like, Screw class tomorrow. I'm off to Kansas City. And I just sat by myself in the outfield. There were probably only like 5,000 people at the game that day. It was a little cold and cloudy and rainy. And uh, I had the time of my life just watching the Royals, uh, you know, play two against the Rays. Believe it or not, they actually won both of those games. So that was more enjoyable. Uh, But, yeah, there you go. That was a a long rant there about skipping out on obligations that you should probably be doing. Uh, what's, uh, I'll ask you, D.Y., what, what is the number one thing that you maybe have skipped in the past for, like, a sporting event or any kind of event? I mean, I'm not a concert guy, but I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that have skipped a lot of things like work or school to go to some concert that meant a lot to them. Yeah, you know, the thing that immediately pops into my mind, not a concert, it's definitely sports, is that I would always skip even, like, to be honest, even in elementary school, middle school, high school, my parents let me stay home for the day for the first two days of the NCAA basketball tournament. Like not, I was not missing because it starts like, well, when I was in Ohio, it started at noon here. It starts Mm -hmm. around 11. I was, I'm never going to miss the first two days of the NCAA basketball tournament. Yeah. Uh, that, that is also something that I, um, I maybe called it, uh, called it a day early to, uh, to watch when I was working in radio down here. I, I can just remember for some reason, I always seem to, to be sick. Uh, when ESPN used to do like the 24 hours of college basketball marathon uh, that I, that was not intentional on my part, but I think I had back to back years in high school where the only day that I missed sick was that day. So, you know, it's nine 30 in the morning. I feel like crap, but you know, I feel a little bit better cause I'm getting ready to watch Valparaiso play Marist or something, you know, That's one me. of those games, one of those games to really get the blood flowing uh, and make you feel better. But uh, K State getting ready for Oklahoma State. We got to hear from Chris Kleiman on Tuesday to give his thoughts on how the bye week went for K State and also how they are preparing for Oklahoma State. We'll start with some of the bad news because Chris Kleiman was asked about it. Asa Newsom not on the depth chart anymore for K State. And Chris Kleiman started it off by just, you know, hey, uh, not great news. He got, he had something happen during the, the open week in practice, and uh, they're going to use the red shirt on him this year. So ex- explain, D.Y., what you know on the situation, but also just how significant this is, because it doesn't necessarily impact K-State on the field in a major way this year, but for a guy that is going to be out, it would seem, for some time with an injury, it's more so going to stunt some development that would have him ready to go next year when K-State is you know, in a, in a more likely chance of needing him in a major way. Yeah, the ideal thing would have been for him to continue to, you know, get whatever snaps he could this year for to gain that necessary experience. Think about, you know, the problem that Kansas State's having this year. Um, a lot of their, you know, setbacks, failures, breakdowns in communication, whatever it may be, has been a product of inexperience. And the good thing is they were gathering a lot of that this year, whether it be Asa Newsom, Austin Romaine, VJ Payne, Jacob Parrish like a lot of new faces, but now Easton Newsom's going to be short on that again next year, just because he's not, he's not going to take any more snaps this season. Now, does it really change the product for this immediate year too much? 
um, probably in a limited manner, maybe even more so in special teams where he was actually making more of an impact just because of how many he is on um, in terms of the phases. But I, I think he, I'm not sure he had 10 defensive snaps combined the last three games. So not making a significant impact on that side of the ball, although he could have by the end of the year if he continued to gain that experience, especially with the opportunities that are in front of him because he was going to be relied upon for depth at some point this year. You know, not in, like, like I said, not in a significant manner. But now you just you have one last guy. I mean, you're, both of your season-ending injuries now have happened at the linebacker spot between he and Daniel Green. So, uh, and, and another part of this, it's probably not confirmed, and, and but I would say that it's likely that he's not going to be a full participant for spring football either, which that would have been another time for growth. So you, you'd like him to have all these chances at development and the experience that he's going to miss over time. We also got some updates on guys that are you know, likely to be in a better state of health for the, the game this weekend. Uh, Chris Kleiman basically said that you know everybody that did play in the game, aside from Ace on special teams against UCF, they will be ready in whatever capacity against Oklahoma State on Friday. Probably the two most notable there, wide receiver. He talked about Keegan Johnson, R.J. Garcia, at least mentioned them by name. Um, and then also on the offensive line, just the expectation would be Christian Duffy is in a position to get more reps and spend more time out there on the field now. Uh, what did you make of Chris Kleiman's injury comments regarding those guys offensively? It's going to get everybody back, right? You got Trayshawn Ward coming back, RJ Garcia coming back, Christian Duffy feeling better and better. So I think, excuse me, I think you'll always take like a full cupboard, right? You know, you don't want to mm -hmm. be playing with the limited options. I at the same time, I thought it was interesting when he was asked about maybe the DJ Giddens usage and how that changes based on his performance, you know, against UCF when he almost rattled off 300 yards and he did have four touchdowns that, yeah, maybe we need to look into maybe, you know, this isn't reading in between the lines. This isn't like a quote unquote here from Chris Kleiman, but maybe it shouldn't be exactly a 50, 50 timeshare between he and Trayshawn Ward that maybe DJ Giddens has earned the right to receive the, the lion's share. So that'll be interesting. Because yeah, I do I mean, think DJ Giddens, I do think I think there is a gap between those two in terms of how they performed, but I also still think there is there is still a space there, still is room for Trayshawn Ward to have an impact. But if that's going to be DJ Giddens, you're much better with him on the field than off. Well, and we talked about that, you know, earlier this week already about how is that going to develop, how are things going to look uh, with the running backs? You know, when he talked about getting the receivers and, and trying to get them healthier with Johnson and Garcia, that has a direct impact. And one of the things that K-State maybe has some questions about right now offensively, and that would be their vertical passing. Here's what Chris Kleiman had to say on that today. Still trying to continue to improve on it. Without a doubt, we've been able to, to be efficient offensively. I mean, we're, we're moving the ball and gaining a lot of yards and, and points and um, pleased with where we're at offensively. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I guess when you look at it from the flip side, we're giving up more explosive plays on defense, which we've got to control. You'd, you'd hope you'd get a few more on offense. That's probably where it's more glaring is the fact that the amount we've given up on defense compared to what we've gotten on offense. Um, and so, you know, we got to fix the issues we have on defense, but on offense, continue to find ways to push the ball downfield for sure. Did you find it weird at all that in you know a question that was geared towards talking about the offensive struggles throwing the ball down the field that Chris Kleiman kind of flipped that to the defense and honestly the answer ends up being more about the defense than anything um, and and just saying hey that they're giving up a lot of big explosive plays in that regard at times so it's kind of you know not masking the offensive deficiencies as much as it normally would. You know, in a way, it, he's got a point here, right? That it's it's more glaring because the discrepancy is so wide because the defense is giving up their share, like a significant amount of share. And maybe it's less of a problem if they're taking care of their own business because the offense, when it comes to ten plus, twenty plus, and even thirty plus yard plays, it's getting it. It's it's the forty and fifty plus long ones that you just put in the end zone that they're not finding. And that's where you need a vertical passing game and where they're falling short right now. So I get what he's talking about. 
I also thought that he and Will Howard both kind of acknowledged, yeah, this vertical passing game isn't where it needs to be right now. And and, and not not necessarily much pushback there, right? It's yeah. like, oh, it's it's good. No, he's right. They're sustaining drives. They're moving the ball. It's just like it's so hard to score in the red zone nowadays because of the way teams defend. Like the the, the field shrinks. Yeah, we, me and you are sitting there next to each other in the press box a, a lot. And we kind of grown multiple times, maybe a handful of times, several times this year, because Kansas State still gets stuck in that that first and goal from like the nine or ten yeah. that you don't want to be in. That's part of the you know, the vertical passing game that can help you alleviate some of that. So that they need they do need to rectify that. Whether that's hey Keegan Johnson becomes Keegan Johnson at some point, still waiting on that, or maybe it's going to twelve personnel because Garrett Oakley. Maybe he's the new toy that they have to work in and use that double tight situation and take one less receiver on the field too. So we'll see how – look, Colin Klein's a brilliant offensive mind. Chris Klein's a great head coach. I assume they're going to find the answer. I, I'm very confident that they'll find the answer. And they got multiple ways that they can go about it. Um, but I think they do understand that they kind of need that. And some of it's just better execution, whether it's – Wide receivers got to got to get that separation at a more consistent level at a, at a more regular clip, more frequent, or doing more after the catch as well. That can be a thing if some of them have the the ability to do that. And Will Howard has to, you know, he is so laser, so you know, razor close to to connecting on a few of those. It's not like that's that's why I push back a little bit. Like Will Howard's been so bad, so bad. It's like he's been off, but he's this close yeah. to being right on too. Yeah. I thought for a second there, you were going to go all Joe Hall laser focused on us. Uh, yeah. I thought you were going to say, uh, laser, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm the same way as you on, on the Will Howard thing. And I, you know, I, I, he obviously could be maybe a little bit more precise. He would tell you, I'm sure that, yeah, he's not hitting on those like he, he has. And I think also part of it is he rose the bar for himself so high, so fast last year because he was so good at that. I mean, think about the plays he made right off the bat against TCU and Oklahoma State in that regard. And then he also had, you know, the, the big touchdown pass to RJ Garcia that was a, a bomb in the Big 12 title game. He hit Malik Knowles on a great route that, that Knowles ran. Um, but I just think, you know, there there's a lot of developing that has to go on here with with Howard just learning with the different receiving group he has this year and uh, getting accustomed to that and and everything else. I, I think he's going to be fine. I mean, every other aspect of Will Howard this season, it seems like he's improved. I mean, his completion percentage is up six yeah. points. Um, yeah, he could take care of the ball a little bit better, but, you know, the, he's thrown a couple of picks that you could put blame on both him and the receiver. And also, uh, I'm okay with as many times as he throws the ball. If he turns the ball over once a game, that you know what by the end of the year, based off what everything else he's doing, the ratio is going to work out just fine for him. I think you can get away with you know if Will Howard throws twelve picks this year, he averages one a game. I mean, last year he, it's a little different. He threw twenty three passes a game when he was the quarterback for K State. In the seven games, K State attempted basically twenty three passes a game with Will Howard. This year they're attempting close to thirty five a game with Will Howard at quarterback. So. There's obviously a different way in, in how they're doing things, and the more times you put the ball in the air, the more times you're going to probably turn it over. Um, that's why before the season, I, I was pretty strong in thinking that Will Howard's per game interception rate would go up. It has. I'm not alarmed by it in any way. It, some of the ones downfield early in the year where he was forcing it, where I think you look at it and say, eh, that's a little scary. Uh, but for the most part, I, I think – you know, he'll be fine. They'll get things figured out. And the hope would be that with the health and then also this bye week, you're able to kind of strengthen the possibilities there. And you're getting to play a team in Oklahoma State that is really susceptible to the pass. Uh, yeah, Oklahoma State, I mean, some people would say that his coming out party might have been the TCU game in Fort Worth where he really took off before. I think even he got a little bit banged up and, and that game kind of fell apart on them. But I mean, the one where he really busted on the scene where they went 48 to zero over Oklahoma state at home, he gets carried off the field. So maybe the, you know, just what the doctor ordered is the Oklahoma state Cowboys. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, speaking of vertical passing and downfield stuff and Chris Kleiman spinning it onto the defense, 
one of the things that was noticed also in the depth chart this week is that they had flipped the safety spots that VJ Payne and Kobe Savage were at. Here's what Chris Kleiman said in regards to that move. Yeah, that was before UCF. Yeah, so I mean, so no, we we did that before UCF. Uh, so we switched their positions before UCF, um, and so now they've had another two weeks to get acclimated. You say that. Klanerman does a really good job of, of making guys versatile and having to play different spots in practice, spring ball, fall camp. So it was something that we thought would help our team, but it wasn't like a wholesale change, like somebody moving from safety to linebacker or linebacker to D-line. Um, we have so many interchangeable guys in the secondary. All right, what do you make of the move? Uh, Kobe Savage and VJ Payne switching spots as the defense kind of looks for some answers in a struggling secondary. Yeah, yeah, I think they probably just almost about an experimentation thing just because of the big plays that they had been surrendering. And like he said, it didn't show up on the depth chart until this week, but obviously that change was existed during the UCF game. So probably still figuring their way out there a little bit, I would imagine. But, I mean, it's where VJ played, VJ Payne played last year. So maybe getting back – to what Pratt's was a little bit more comfortable for him because, I mean, he did. I mean, if we're being honest, you know, put us up to the lie detector test. I like to say that BJ Payne was better at that position last year than he showed in the first few games this year, probably. And maybe they're just trying to reinvigorate that kind of BJ Payne performance. One other thing in regards to guys having to make adjustments over the bye week. We've talked about it a lot this year because he is, uh, I think, officially a DY my guy. Uh, if he, if you want to take the the John Kurtz methodology here, Chris Tennant was brought up this week. It was a little shaky against UCF again, and uh, here's what Chris Kleiman had to say about his kicker. You know, I thought he had a really good week um, last week, uh, exceptional week. I was wondering how he would bounce back, um, and uh, I, I've seen a different side of him from a mentality standpoint that is encouraging that I thought he would have struggled last year getting over some of his, his difficult days uh, and you know have not uh, seen that thus far uh, in the last week, week and a half. And so I'm excited about getting Chris out there and letting him bang him because uh, he's got great leg strength, great talent, and he seems to not be bothered, which is good. All right. I mean, it, it is kicker. And I think sometimes we put too much emphasis into the points that get left out there by a kicker, uh, but they are still important in some respects. I mean, Chris Tennant missed a field goal at Mizzou. K-State lost by a field goal at Mizzou. Uh, where where do you take what Chris Kleiman said on on Chris Tennant and, and how do you think K-State has handled it this week? And honestly, how do they put that into practice then when they face Oklahoma State on Friday night if Chris Tennant does struggle? Ultimately, I don't take a whole lot from it. I guess the, the one takeaway I would have is, uh, you know, he's grown up to the point where he's not distraught or completely crumbling when mistakes are made because guess what? Everyone's going to make mistakes. Chris Tent's going to make another one. He has to be more efficient. He can't miss one every other game. He can't miss one every game. He can't miss extra points. So there is, you know, he really flirts with the margin for error quite a bit, and and that needs to be corrected. But if he is going to handle that adversity better, then there should be a longer gap in between those, and we'll see how it works itself out. I will just say, and and I don't know if the, it's a my guy thing, but yeah. I, but I but I will say that we're past the time for words. Like I understand the question, I understand the answer. But it, it comes down to Chris Tennant's going to ultimately show us if he's the guy or not by his performance on the field. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, the the term that Chris Kleiman would use, uh, given nut what up. he said, yeah, he would nut up. Uh, the, given what he said against Texas Tech last year, uh, some would also say put up or shut up. Whatever whatever term you want to use, it is that time for Chris Tennant, you know, whether it's you know fair or not, which I think it is fair, and unfortunately that's just the life of a kicker. Um, this is going to be a big stretch for him because you can deal with you know a few misses throughout the season. Those are going to happen, 
But when there are enough of them in such a tight time frame, it becomes tough uh, when you're dealing with the kicker. Now, yeah, that, that that made me think of the, the there was that one week last year where, yes, we, we had Chris Kleiman on TV. I think it was before a game or at halftime talking about needing to nut up. I think it was a home game. Against yeah, well, it was, it was the Texas Tech game. He did it on ra- radio, I'm pretty sure. At first, I, I was in the bathroom at halftime, so I heard the radio broadcast, and he was talking about Walters, and he said something about needing to nut up. I was like, okay. How about that? Uh, that that's I mean, hey, fair. And then it was either before that game or after that game. When we have coordinators, which is a Thursday. This week it's Wednesday, but Thursday coordinators. I remember Joe Klinerman said something about I forget who he was talking about playing their balls off. I was like, man, we're just getting all these sexual <laughs> references. Yeah, well, you got you gotta love that. Uh, yeah, the, he he did say it on TV as well last year. We got a nut up here in the second half. <laughs> uh, I love that. I mean, I really, I really do. I, I gotta, I gotta respect him for just you know telling it how it was. Uh, it's a to, to be uh, the way the way they talk. Sometimes these are total like ball coaches. The staff like the way they talk, and they, and yeah. I like when they, the genuine part of them, the way that they talk in football vernacular, comes out sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well. There is an opponent that K-State is facing this week. It is Oklahoma State. It is the Cowboys. And there were a couple of things that Chris Kleiman said that had to do specifically with Oklahoma State, one of which is, you know, talking about the last two trips to Stillwater. And, you know, people were asking him, hey, like, what what do you do differently? Is there any extra motivation for you? He was like, no, not really like it. We just got to go down there and win. And basically said that the last two times, the reason they, they got beat in Stillwater is because they got beat on the line of scrimmage. Where where do you take his comments on that? And, and where does K-State stand on the line uh, going into the, this third trip to Stillwater with Chris Kleiman as their head coach? They definitely got beat on the line of scrimmage. What was it, a 19 with a few rain delays too, I believe, in Stillwater. I, I want to say that was also a night game where – I think it was soon after the win over Mississippi State, where like, man, is this team for real? Even in year one, they're climbing, and I thought they got their ass beat at the line of scrimmage. And twenty-one, I remember less about that. Was that the twenty to eighteen game? I want to say, or was that uh, 20? so twenty-one? Well, so nineteen was it wasn't very competitive at the end. Case it lost by like two scores. They settled for that field goal that meant nothing, and then twenty-one. It was back and forth early, and K-State felt like they could, but then Will Howard got hurt. It was the Jaron Lewis show from there. Uh, so, yeah, that they haven't had the, the greatest of luck down there. Yeah, I mean, a lot of scrimmage is definitely, from what I am at, from what I remember, it definitely was problematic, especially in 19. So he's right, and I also think he's right in that probably not a whole lot to take from last year's 48 to zero win. He scored 48 on them. Now they're playing an entire defensive scheme. I think half that defense transferred anyway. You got new quarterbacks. I just Oklahoma State is so different. Now Kansas State has the same defense, but quite a few different players. You're missing Felix and Zama and company. Yeah. You got the same offense, but you're attacking differently because you don't have these spawn. So I Aside from what I believe is correct, that the line of scrimmage is going to play a pretty huge factor in this game. I just last year's results, I think, mean very little. I mean, Oklahoma State was a lot better so far, at least a lot better last year than they are this year. And I and I doubt Kansas State goes to Stillwater and wins by 48. Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm not a- anticipating that. What I will say is. And I got this from Stats of War, who does the C- CFP graphs and compares the teams and kind of comes up with the probabilities and spreads and everything. He, he has a Kansas State about a 10 or 11 point favorite. And, and that's kind of where the books have it as well. I think it started at about nine and a half, shot up to 11 and a half pretty quickly. And it's kind of settled there. But I mean, it's interesting. And a lot of the advanced metrics, I think, you know, Kansas State fans and, and, and rightfully so. In, to an extent, very disappointed with the way the defense has performed this year. The offense has not been sharp, but good enough. But you look at all the advanced metrics, and and Kansas State's like top thirty in the country in nearly every category. Yeah, even even defensively. So it's like, whew. one, it's like, man, how did you lose to Missouri? But I get it. But two is like, because of those metrics and those numbers, 
a lot of these guys that have these predictive formulas, where it be Kelly Ford, Stats of War, Bill Connolly. I mean, Kansas State, aside from the Texas game, they're going to be favored in every game going forward, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, and another thing in this is we can be concerned or whatever about, you know, K-State's defense and how it's gone on. And, you know, you you talk about like the advanced numbers are still in favor of K-State, even just like the generic ones. I mean, K-State in terms of their total defense, despite having the worst pass defense in the Big 12, they are still fifth in the league. And that's because the rushing defense has been so good early this year. They're only giving up two and a half yards a carry and, and you know, and less than 75 rate. a game. Yeah, and success rate, but you're going by down and distance. Now they got crushed on third and fourth down against UCF. I get that. Yeah. But even when you look at the pass defense outside of the big plays, it's, I mean, they're getting it done here. Especially some of that is skewed because the first two games literally didn't allow yeah. either one of SEMO or Troy to move the ball whatsoever. So a little bit of it's skewed, and it'll continue to kind of even out with those two performances being so dominant. But, man – in the game, I, I think Kent State's defense is actually solid, but their mistakes are just the frustrating kind, so it makes yes. it seem worse than it is. Yeah, no, you're right, and I think that's kind of what Chris Kleiman was saying, uh, you know, about the the vertical passing is the plays they have given up have been ginormous. And you think about the UCF game; they have been some that you just tear your head out because it's like a third and twenty draw. It's a third and fifteen screen that beats you. All these things where you go, man, you should be able to take care of that. And that's you have them right where you want them. Yep. Yep. You have them right where you want them. And another thing, interesting, the run the run defense is still good. It doesn't need any qualifiers across the board. But if you take away like the two or three best runs, biggest runs that they've allowed, Kansas State's allowing like 1.3 yards of rush this year. Yeah, that was uh, that was a good a good dig by by Fitz uh, today in the press conference asking Chris Klein about that. And like, I mean, it's funny because there is a college football pundit out there who did say K State's rush defense sucked. Right? You know, that was the that was the gist of uh, what what Mister Look at Me Boyd on Twitter said. Um, K State's been fine there. I you know UCF busted some big ones on them. They, they've been fine. That's obviously been a strength. Uh, one other thing you said was about 2022's game not having much of an impact. Here's what Chris Kleiman said. He shares the same Um, Well, it was a big win, for sure, Uh, and we played well. But, uh, you know, two totally different teams in my mind. Uh, We, you know, a lot of things went right for us uh, last year and and made some plays and – you know, I, but I don't take a lot from it. I don't. We don't look at the film and say, "Boy, we're going to get this or that" because of you know just two totally different teams. So I mean, yeah, he's he's right, and I I think it's it's good to hear, even though you probably would have expected it. Hey, they're they're not putting much stock into what happened last year. Um, I bet Oklahoma State will. They yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's a little it's a little different when you lose that game, as we've seen, like the Missouri situation, where you can use it as like a fire for you. Certainly don't look back on a win and go, ah, oh, yeah, we got it easy. You know, <laughs> it's a different year, different team. I wouldn't do that, but uh, two of those, two of those in the Big Twelve this week because you got you got Oklahoma coming back yeah. to losing, gotten their ass kicked by Texas, forty nine to zero. Maybe they just suck at football in the state of Oklahoma. Maybe that's what it is. People <laughs> are asking. Say? Yeah, Who's to say. Uh, one thing from last year's game that might carry over into this one, though is Oklahoma State putting multiple quarterbacks on the field. Last year, not necessarily by choice, but we got to uh, see the wonderful debut of Gunnar Gundy in Big 12 action, shaking hands and everything. Yeah, uh, he was shaking out there. Here's what Chris Kleiman said on possibly having to face three Oklahoma State quarterbacks. Well, you got to look at, at all the guys that have played, but you know, the most recent one was the Iowa State game where Bowman played uh, the entirety of that game, and, and I thought they did some really, really good things offensively, so that would be the anticipation. Um, and then we've got to adapt and adjust if it's somebody else, but I would anticipate Bowman playing. How much of an impact does it actually have if – you know, whichever of the three quarterbacks is on the field at any given time, because n- none of the three seem like they are uh, capable of being, you know, uh, there's 14 teams in the Big 12 now. I don't know that they're capable of being a top 10 quarterback in this league. No, I mean, Bowman has the best arm talent of the three, I think. Uh, his decision-making is not up to par. But, but well, here's my thing. Like, the, those three quarterbacks aren't so different that you have to prepare – 
it's not like you're preparing for Michael Vick and Peyton Manning. Like, yeah, these guys aren't drastically different from one another. They're all just very yeah. mediocre guys. <laughs> yeah, it's not. You know, we, we we've seen some some others in the in Big 12's past. I mean, you know, Jake Waters and Daniel Sams, two different types of quarterbacks. Adrian not Will that. Howard. Adrian yeah. Will Howard. Yes, exactly. That that's the one where teams last year probably like Oklahoma State. And, you know, I guess Baylor um, and Texas all had to think, like, which Texas. guy are we going to see? I don't know um, if Baylor had that. Yeah, Baylor, around. I guess, would have expected Adrian to play. He just got hurt in that game. But Texas and, and O-State last year probably had to spend a little bit of extended time saying, all right, if Adrian is in the game, this is what we're doing. If it's Howard, this is what we're doing and uh, going from there. Now, one other thing, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll bring this in here. Uh, this is uh, – the uh, we'll, we'll give a shout out to Glenn Kinley and uh, KSNT in Topeka for for this. Uh, this was Will Howard uh, on his lone interaction with Mike Gundy, uh, given the uh, status of the game that uh, he played in Stillwater when Skylar Thompson was hurt. This is a hilarious story. It does feel like I've been I've been around here for a while. Coach Gundy actually um, in 2021 when I was playing and starting that game because Skylar had just gotten hurt. He actually came up to me and and told me he hopes that I feel better and, and that, you know, we wanted to play me soon. And I was like, he must think I'm Skyler. <laughs> so <laughs> it was pretty funny, but that's really the only interaction I've ever had with Coach Gundy. But, um, I mean, that's uh, that's a pretty Mike Gundy thing, I guess, to, to you know, go over and assume that the, the quarterback you're talking to is a, a certain guy and it's totally not him. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I hope to play you soon. If I was Will Howard, I'd have been like, you're going to play me in like 10 minutes, man. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I guess I guess you haven't kept up. Uh, are you aware of our situation right now? Yeah, that's – uh, it, it makes me think of and, – and this is not necessarily – and I won't say too many names here. This It was a previous Kansas State staff, so not even the one under Chris Klein and the one before that. So uh, the only name I'll mention is Kai Thomas. He's visiting Kansas State as a recruit. Everyone remembers him. He's like a three-star, four-star kid mm-hmm. out of Topeka High. Really, really talented. Hasn't had the best of college careers like we anticipated. Uh, a few good gains in Minnesota, um, which he picked over the Wildcats when Chris Kleiman took over and tried to bring him to Manhattan. Anyways, Kai Thomas, uh, I mean, this borderline number one player in Kansas, right? Yeah, and ever plenty of offers. And there's a Kansas State assistant that goes up and shakes his kid's hand and asks him his name doesn't even know it's guy thomas so i mean we think about it <laughs> <laughs> i mean what a what a what a thing uh yeah you're right on the kai thomas career kind of a strange deal i mean yeah he, he made it to ku last year they used him heavily in the they used about him the heavily in the bowl game too which was weird and then he transferred so uh he's yeah. he's he's a, he's a golden State. flash now he hasn't played yeah. yet this year but uh, man th- those uh Kansas State Associations in Kent yeah. State because they got Jaron Lewis on the roster too, right? Yeah, yeah they do. I haven't even seen how uh, that's been going. I mean, he uh, Jaron Lewis has not attempted a pass this year, so he may not be uh, seeing the field at all. Man, golden flashes. Jaron Lewis will always have that touchdown pass in, in 2021 in Stillwater to Deuce Vaughn, a miracle uh, play for him for, well, I guess, his lone touchdown pass at K-State. Uh, anything else from Chris Kleiman this week that stood out to you or that you want to sneak in before the next time we talk to everybody, which will be on Thursday, a uh, day earlier for the pregame pod, getting ready for the Cats in the weekend ahead? Uh, I got nothing. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, that's that's good. Then we're, we're good. We're all set. Just wanted to make sure that I let you get everything in that you needed to. Uh, if, you know, I'm, I'm sure as a, as a man that enjoys many things, uh, you'll be locked into some Major League Baseball postseason uh, throughout the day and night as uh, it goes on. I The Rays and Rangers, we're recording this on Tuesday afternoon. Rays and Rangers took like two hours to play a 4 nothing awesome. game. Wasn't, wasn't there like 10 errors in that game too? <laughs> uh, probably. I, I only saw half of it. I mean, I yeah, I, I saw the I first think, half of it and then it flew I, by. I, I think Tampa had five errors themselves. So. And when it when it shocked me. Also, this is a random note. People probably don't care. Through two games that have been played in the Major League postseason, no team has worn one of their primary uniforms yet. <laughs> all four teams have worn alternate uniforms, which I'm not complaining about. 
because Toronto looks good in the all like electric blue they got going. The twins are wearing the twins. like the cream. Twins I hate the piece. twins in general. The, there's there's not one that. there's not one thing the Minnesota Twins wear where I'm like I like you guys. I don't know why it's one of the teams I hate the most. Even though one of my favorite baseball movies is Little Big League, which mm. is the which is the Minnesota Twins when the when the kid's like the owner manager because his <sighs> grandpa lends him down the team. Um, fan of that, but I hate the Twins in general. They were they were hitting the shell the ball in the first few innings. I don't know if that's continuing. Yeah, they're they're up uh, three nothing as I'm watching here. Uh, what? All right, we, I I don't know that we have you on record for this. You talk about liking little big league. Let's finish off the show uh, with this. What is your favorite sports movie of all time? Or honestly, if you want to give me like a, a like a quick like top five off the top of your head, or you know, you can do four and we can make it a Mount Rushmore or something. No, I realize these aren't like cinematically what I would put in the top five because I'm not like cinematically you'd put in field of dreams. Yeah, no, not. put, put like what you enjoy. Don't, yeah. don't try and be like a movie critic here. Yeah. Yeah. Cause movie critic, I get why field of dreams is up there, but like, I'm going to fall asleep and to that movie most of the time. I, feel, I hear it real quick. Field of dreams take for you. I will watch field of dreams when it is on, but it's a very slow moving movie. You don't like for, Seven eighths of the movie, you're like, yeah, this isn't that great. Like, what what's going on here? I think to appreciate Field of Dreams, you have to have a good relationship with your father and like appreciate all that. And so then at the end, it's that last moment where you, it, it hits you and you're like, damn, like that. This is this is it. But up into that point, it's a pretty like whatever movie. Um, and I guess they're just lucky that they stuck it in the middle of a cornfield and and now it's turned into such a big thing for everybody because it's it's not a great movie. It's pretty boring and lame. No, it, it is very boring. So the ones that I would enjoy, I don't know if I'd put a little big league in top five that I enjoy. Maybe I would. Um, Major League, that's yeah. got to be in there. Major League, that might be number one. Like I will watch that every time that it is on TV. Like. I'm not going to say, oh, Major League, and then flip on something else. No, I'm watching Major League. The Super Bowl could be on. I'm like, no, I'm watching Major League. Um, <laughs> uh, so that one, and this one's far from cinematic. So, And there is definitely errors in this movie that make it very, very wrong. But I enjoy the replacements with Keanu Reeves. Like, that is really good, in my opinion. Um, at least enjoyable. Like, there's, there's a lot that's wrong with it. Um, and I understand that. Remember the Titans because it like there are some experiences that I had in school that kind of like coincide with that. Not necessarily the race thing, but everything okay. else. I was I was about to say, honestly, I was about to to make. No, no, joke. like the lock, the lock, the locker room stuff when you're doing like you're getting pumped up together. Yeah. I was so, about to make like a joke, and, and then I was like, I don't know that people would realize that I'm joking, and I don't even want the clip to be out there. I was gonna be like, oh yeah, dy like big racist in high school. I don't want people thinking that, <laughs> so I, w I wasn't gonna say it like a just a straight up delivery there. Uh, yeah. But I'm glad you clarified because people probably would have been wondering, like, wait, he had similar experiences in high school. What what is he t like? <laughs> what is he talking about? He no, he no, went to no, high school no, in the two yeah. 2000s. The, the pumped up rah rah stuff more yes. more or less. So remember the Titans. What I say replacements, major yeah. league. Trying to think, man. There's not a whole lot. Um, I actually watched Space Jam the other day, which I would consider. Um, mm. but I guess what it does not age well. So I, <laughs> Space oh. Jam's kind of a rough rewatch anymore. Uh, on a, did, did Space Jam not age well, or did you not age well? Because now you're in your 30s and you're not a child. Yeah, well, that's, that's definitely a part of it. I thought I liked it in college, even, but man. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's uh, I look. I think Rookie of the Year is too cheesy for me. Um, so that that's not in my wheelhouse. I'm very and, and we're dragging us on so i apologize i'm really not a big bull durham guy and i know a lot of people are so yeah no i'm with you on that i bull durham is kind of whatever to me uh i and i love baseball like that's baseball is mm -hmm. my my number one you give me a chance to watch i, I will choose baseball over everything but i don't really and there's you know, no, go crazy I, for bull durham. I, I, am i missing anything like obvious ones i don't know well let me let me give you my 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 top five real quick okay M Major League is easily my number one. Yep. Uh, that's my top movie of all time. That's the that is the number one thing that I will always watch it 
it, I will scout it out and try and find it to, to make my wife watch it with me, even though she doesn't really get it. The sequels uh, are bad. <laughs> the sequels are bad. Uh, I, I would Major League Two isn't bad, um, but n- number three is awful. It shouldn't even really count as a as a Major League offshoot. Two, though, I can I can do number two. Number three, no, not for me. Uh, other other ones that I would put on my list. Uh, these are two that probably some people go wouldn't think of traditionally, but Dodgeball and Talladega Nights are two great sports movies that I will always watch. Okay. Well, then that, that jargs my memory. So I'm not a huge Talladega Nights guy. I know that's weird. People are going to probably send yeah, me hate fight you. Yeah, people are going to send me hate mail for this. But it, it brought his Will Ferrell's in a bunch of sport movies. The the two I like, my two favorite Will Ferrell sports movies, and I know these are off the beaten path a little bit. One is semi-pro. I think it's hilarious as a, the basketball one. And then um, a Blades of Glory, actually. Oh, yeah. Blades of Glory is a good one. Um, I, I love Blades of Glory. One other Will Ferrell sports movie that I like, and this is more you know kid friendly, Kicking and Screaming, I think is hilarious. Um, it, I mean, it it makes me laugh pretty good whenever I watch it. Mike Ditka being in there is hilarious too. So, uh, Kicking Ooh. and Screaming gets an honorable mention. But the jar, the jars, uh, the little giants. I used to love that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not to be confused with Facing the Giants. Two two different movies that I had a tough time as a kid comprehending because you, know, you put as a Cowboys in. fan probably not a big little giants fan yeah I know what the heck I mean come on you know I Cowboys fans like God too I don't know what to tell you <laughs> um so I've got major league dodgeball Talladega Knights on there uh this one a total opposite of kicking and screaming not family friendly do not watch this with your kids division three football's finest is an absolutely hilarious movie if you have like pretty low standards for production value and you're okay with some like really raunchy humor uh d3 football's finest i watched that for the first time in high school and that one it always makes me laugh and now i'll see like random clips from time to time and i'll send it to buddies because it is just the most outrageous funny movie uh so that that one is on my list and then you know like i got a lot of tough ones to to make the cut with i obviously i love golf um I will say this. Tin Cup. Oh, you're a Tin Cup guy. So I I like Happy Gilmore a lot, and I'm not even like the biggest Adam Sandler fan. Um, So that would be in contention for that last spot or Caddyshack. And Caddyshack is one that, like, when I first saw it, I was like, I don't get how this is funny to people. But as I've gotten older, and really after the second time I watched it, it made me laugh harder, especially because – Working on a golf course growing up, especially like, you know, a big time country club like Prairie Dunes, the way that they play up some of the members in Caddyshack, you're like, yes, like I get that. I see that. Uh, So I would probably at this stage, I I would still probably go with Happy Gilmore. Uh, One other sports movie I throw in now that's just naming sports movies, but the Benchwarmers is a, uh, is a both family favorite between my brothers and I, and could, it's a stupid movie but could probably say every line in that movie. Uh, so the bench warmers needed to be mentioned by me, but those are, uh, those are the ones that stand out to me. I would have Tin Cup and have a Gilmore both at a Caddyshack. I'm kind of like what you used to be at Caddyshack. I just can't get into it, I guess, the same way that others. So people are going to yeah. – I'm going to get so much hate mail. I'm just hating on Caddyshack and <laughs> – what was the other one I hated on? Oh, Talladega Nights. Yeah. I'm going to have so You'll many probably get things. more pushback on Caddyshack than Talladega Nights, so, though, because I bet there will be some out there that are like, no, like that's not, uh, they'll freak I, out. I also think, like, like, like I, I've started to come around a little bit, but like Step Brothers, that was like a tough one for me. I'm like, oh, oh wow, yeah. you're just not a big Will Ferrell guy. Well, I am because I love Blades of Glory. I love Semi Pro. Like, those are some great ones. Um, no, that's the way, the, one that I, I don't really seek out to watch. But and you really have to seek it out because it, it's hard to find anyway. But I laughed at a lot because of how terribly made it was, and I, and actually Matt Hall was the one that kind of introduced it to me to, for the first time. Is blue chips? Like oh yes, that is that's like I don't know how that movie came to production. It's like <laughs> I don't know who made it, but it's so bad. I think that's one of the fun things about sports movies is that uh, because sports fans are just so starved for like entertainment that involves sports for them that you will watch like low budget or like 
below average movies in like Wasn't Shaq in that too. Yeah, Shaq yeah. was in it. Uh, yeah, I like I honestly like Draft Day is not a great movie, but if it's on, I'll watch it because it's like oh yeah, yeah they, they slap the NFL logos on it and everything. Like yeah, I'm in. Uh, a good a good one that I want to mention too. You you said remember the Titans. Uh, Glory Road is like the basketball version of that, except Glory Road is a much better movie than Remember the Titans. So uh, I'm a Glory Road fan. Just no room on my list because uh, obviously I get I get more pleasure out of comedies than I do you know the serious stuff. It's not it's not but up my you, alley. Remember the Titans has better acting though, but I guess we're not really it's fair picking apart the production of it. I get, but it's like it has Denzel <laughs> Washington and a very 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 young Ryan Gosling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and Donald Faison. So uh, shout out to Scrubs. Um, uh, and, 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 that, and, and I'll say the one I hate, and I'm sure you'll be a, a supporter of my hatred here. Okay. And, and it was uh, exposed to us what a week ago, two weeks ago, because they were called Gindy was in South Bend. Rudy, terrible. Mm. Uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't love Rudy, but for whatever reason, that's one of those that like it's on, and I might watch it. Uh, honestly, I think I like the little like the music jingle that they have in it that that gets played for some reason. But I think that's probably the only reason I like the movie uh, because the premise of it. Like, I don't like Notre Dame in any fashion. Uh, I you know I the underdog walk on. I could care I less about walk ons. Like, have some talent to get on the field for me. Don't just be some scrappy loser that's annoying. Um, so yeah, the the storyline for Rudy doesn't play for me. Um, and also like the fact that you know some of it's embellished whatever although i think i'm more of a rudy fan now the more i hear joe montana bitch about it and be like oh well you know that's not actually how it happened it's like joe shut the hell up you had a great career you did great football wise like let this guy that it was his dream to play at Notre Dame have a little fun in the sun because they made a movie about him like you both had major impacts in your sport for different reasons you're both great you know irish alums just chill out so honestly joe montana has made me a bigger fan of rudy uh, than the movie itself actually has. Uh, that sounds like a Cowboys fan that just doesn't like Joe Montana. Too. I, I mean, I could care less. I was like negative 15 when Joe Montana. The was game is the Cowboys. Cowboys 49ers. Uh, what I've never personally seen it. I don't know if you have, and then we're really rambling. So if, <laughs> if you've turned it off by now, we're not going to keep talking about Kansas state. So don't worry. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Brian's song, that was one that my dad liked, but I've never, I um, think it was about the Heisman trophy. Uh, well, so yeah, I mean, that's about like, it's about like Gail Sayers and his relationship with, yeah, I, I don't know. People try to tell me that I should watch it. I'm not going to too much KU for you. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I, I boycott Brian's song because it's, it's got too much KU in it. No, I mean, I I know it's about the whole Brian Piccolo thing and I just, I don't know it movies that are made that long ago you're going to have a hard time getting me to watch it. Like Brian. I will say, I will say, like, I will say, and this is how petty I can be as a fan uh, of the sports that I can get away with being a fan. Right. Like part of the reason why I don't like rookie of the year is because it's the Chicago Cubs. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I kind of hate the fact that I, in the American league central, uh, the twins and the Indians, now the guardians, They've got movies about the Tigers for love of the game. Um, and then I, I got to think, I mean, do, do the White Sox, the White Sox have, you know, they have their, their, their fun in the sun. You pick oh. whichever White Sox movie you want to have uh, them involved in where we need more Royals movies. The Royals suck. Remake major league and make it be the Royals. The Reds are worse than the Royals. Historically, you guys still had your two year run. We haven't yeah. even had that. We're like the Royals without the two year run. That's what we are. All right, well, let's uh, let's get a joint movie going, um, Major League, uh, a reboot with a National League and an American League version. Then we can make the Reds and Royals uh, the agents of chaos for the for the film industry. You know, guilty, I'm guilty here, and this is going to sound, I don't, I don't know if this is, because I know people always say you haven't, but I've actually never watched any given Sunday. <laughs> I haven't seen it either. Again, it's one of those that I have to be really interested in the topic or the movie for me to go watch something that was made before I was born. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know when any given Sunday came out, but it seems like a, like a mid-90s movie. Angels uh, in the Outfield just thought gosh, of that one. I actually 99. Like 
99 is any given Sunday, so I guess I, ha- I can't use my made before I was born excuse. Uh, yeah, Angels in the Outfield as a kid, I loved that movie. I, uh, I, I will watch that movie still, too. Like I, I don't know that it holds up, but I, I will watch that. Especially I mean, whenever Cole Manbeck sends us the "Hey, it could happen" gif in the the group chat. You say you don't know if it ever holds up. Like I, I mean, for you know, doing the angel thing, I don't know if that, <laughs> that ever necessarily holds up when yeah, you get the ball. True. When there's a figment of your imagination throwing the ball every which way. So I think if that one held up in the, like the time that it released, it will always hold up. Yeah, that's that's probably true. I guess uh, some of those kids' movies, it's like it's like saying Rookie of the Year. It doesn't hold up, you know. Uh, if anything, Rookie of the Year holds up more now than ever with uh, the success rate of Tommy John surgery. So, uh, may, was that the first PSA for Tommy John? You know, that's that's something for people to discuss. But uh, we can we can probably have a much deeper dive into sports movies uh, in the off season. Uh, fortunately, we we get to go until you know the end of March with K-State football and basketball. So that's a ways off. Uh, but that will do it for DY and I today on the KSO show. We are back again uh, tomorrow, a day earlier. That way we can bring everybody enough time to prepare for the Friday night kick between K-State and Oklahoma State. And to get you better prepared for everything coming this season, make sure you are a part of everything that we do at KSO. You can go get signed up on on three if you're not a part of it already. And also be sure to stay locked into the YouTube and podcast platform. Subscribe there as well to make sure that you get the press conferences, the podcasts, whatever other video content will come your way. You get it instantly. You're not going to miss out. Uh, I know that there will be highlights posted at halftime from the first half on Friday night. And we'll see, you know, depending on the pacing of the game, you may get a full game out of me on the field Friday night in Stillwater. I know they have a better setup for me to leave crap on the field, so I'm not going to be fearful of, like, losing it or somebody taking it from me. So you're because more I'm better to, secure. And you're more likely to get hit by a player because of how tiny the sideline is. Well, you know, I like to be close to the action down there. Actually, I do. I did forget. Uh, the paddles will probably really tucker me out early on. I better bring my headphones down to the field with me, try and block out the noise. Yeah. Is it, like – it's probably easy to get knocked over there, right? You're, you're going to get in, like, hit by a tackler. Mm, the tiniest well, sideline in the Big 12 by far. No, because you can't be on the sidelines there. Uh, you, can, you can only be in the end zones. And there's a little bit more space there. So maybe not as easy, uh, but it does kind of suck when you have to go from one side of the field to the other and you have to go through the tiny little tunnels they make behind the benches. Um, so – uh, hopefully, I'm when I'm walking through there, I'm hearing a lot of cuss words by the Cowboys because they're getting beat so bad. It's going to smell, but at least I know they're upset because they're they're losing to K State. And maybe we can get some hideaway pizza before the game. That's actually mm. really good. Okay. All right. Well, I'm I am down for anything. Although I do know that the Cowboys always bring it for the the meal in the press box wow. beforehand, but nobody cares about that because it's an us thing that has no bearing on them. But If we're replenished with great food, you'll have great content before, during, and after the game. So that's why you should stay locked into KSO. For DY, I'm Mason Voth. We'll be back on Thursday.